whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer. Thank you all for bringing us back to the British Library after two years. All of us know that COVID really took a toll on every sector, and especially the arts and entertainment sector, and everything to do uh, with literature, etc. However, what happened with us at JLF is that we used the occasion to go online very quickly. And as we shut down on the 20th of March in 2020, we went online with a new series on the 4th of April called JLF Brave New World. And we followed one, followed it with JLF Words Are Bridges, which was a series on translations. And both these together with all of the JLFs that went online, JLF London, JLF Boulder, Colorado, uh, JLFs in other parts of the world, really increased our community. When we did JLF last year at the British Library, we had about 7,000 odd people coming through the doors over the two and a half days. In 2021, when we went online, we had 450,000 people watching JLF at the British Library online. And as of today, that number has gone up to 5 million with a reach of 10 million. Similarly, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, which used to attract about half a million people uh, on the ground through the doors every year, in 2021, when we did it online, we reached 27.5 million people. And people who we wouldn't otherwise have even thought would be interested in the Jaipur Literature Festival. While normally our first and second were always people from uh, the US and the UK, third was typically Canada, and then Australia, much of Europe. Now it's changed completely. Our international audiences today come still number one and two from the United States and the United Kingdoms. But three is Germany, four is China, five is Indonesia, six is Uzbekistan, don't ask me why, but it is. <laughs> Nine is Saudi Arabia, 10 is Japan. So it's completely changed for us the way that we see the festival. And none of this would have been possible if COVID hadn't forced us to change the way that we get literature and knowledge and information out. As you all know that when we began the festival, our whole idea is can we use considered knowledge and considered information to push back on the narrative of hatred by creating opportunities to understand other languages, other cultures, other people, other traditions, other religions, other colors, other castes, because it's through ignorance that you have hatred. And through hatred, you have the kind of violence that we're seeing that's consumed all of us. So we gather here again in 2022, delightfully to do both a physical festival and a hybrid festival. We'll be online, you can watch us online. And of course, we would love for you to come every day uh, today, Saturday, and Sunday for this incredible program that Namita William and our colleagues at Teamwork Arts have put together and savor the riches 
before we go there, I left my glass of wine just behind there. I wanted to raise a toast um, to our wonderful Booker. <laughs> Ten days ago, as many of you know, the, the International Booker Award was uh, announced, and Gitanjali Shri, who is going to be speaking tomorrow, won the award. And it was for the first time a translation of from Hindi into English, which is now hopefully going to be seen in French and in many other, already in French and in many other languages. You will hear Gitanjali apart from a slew of all our wonderful authors here over the next few days. So just to raise a toast, even if it's water, uh, to you Gitanjali and to all our visiting writers who've joined us today. Our charity partners, and as you know, every year we try and have a charity partner because we do understand the need to be able to reach out and help as many people as possible. Our charity partners this year is the Salam Balak Trust, who works with street and working children. Uh, the charity was set up 32, 33 years ago in India. Uh, today they look after about 9,500 kids every year, kids who run away from home. Our colleagues from uh, Salam Balak Trust should be here. Uh, Nick is here. Nick, if you wave, people will know who you are. And then anybody wants to speak to Nick, please do so. Anybody wants to write a check to Nick, please do so. <laughs> uh, he'll, be, he'll be delighted. And, uh, and finally, just a big thank you again to all our many sponsors, to Hannah Rothschild and the Rothschild Foundation, who literally, at the very last minute, uh, William asked them to help fund this large deficit that we had this year. The sentiment still seems to be from sponsors that we love you, but we're not sure whether we're giving anybody money. Uh, but Hannah Rothschild Foundation did. British Council stepped up to the table literally at the last minute. <laughs> Rebecca Skinder, thank you so much. Our wonderful partners, of course, our sweet partners, Sumit, your organization has been amazing. So thank you for keeping our livers happy. And uh, uh, yeah, Haldiram, thank you so much. Uh, to Rajasthan Tourism. I don't know whether Gayatri Rathra has finally found her uh, way. Where? Hi, Gayatri. Thank you so much. Rajasthan Tourism are our partners in India as well. Serena and HS who have just walked in, uh, who were our founding uh, sponsors and, of course, the sponsors of the DSC Prize for Literature. HS Serena, thank you all so much. And finally, to all our colleagues at the British Library. You know, for us, we go to so many different parts of the world. When we come here, it's really, we work together as a team. We had, a, as we said, a wee fire. Did it change our plans? Not really, it's <laughs> par for the course. But we did all of this because we really work together wonderfully. So, so thank you, Roly, Jamie, Conrad, John, B, everybody who's made this possible. And to tell you a little bit about the program, can I ask Namita to say a few words, talk about the program, and then William. And then we'll have a wee bit of a break while we play the audiovisuals. And Rebecca will come and introduce the session that we're all waiting for with Monica Ali and with Jeshri. Thank you. Namita. So uh, both Sanjoy and William just speak from the top of their head. And though I've heard some of it before, but they just know how to speak like this. I have a piece of paper. Please forgive that. But I'm going to uh, move away from my script to say that what you just saw today is really the essence of the Jaipur Literature Festival, the flexibility, the commitment uh, to immediately turn a crisis that could have faced many other people into a fun afternoon, evening, outside in the sun where uh, nobody's frowning, nobody's looking stressed except maybe me. Yeah, but <laughs> They, uh, teamwork, I, I want to raise, uh, not a toast, we've had Mithai to do that. Let's give Teamworks and the British Library a huge clap for just... <laughs> just for holding it together in the face of just things going a little, more than a little bit wrong. So I'm returning here to the British Library after a gap of three years. Uh, it's, it continued, as Sanjoy told you, to be hybrid, to be digital, 
but it's different to be in these familiar surroundings welcoming you here. So much has changed in these years, but books and ideas and creativity and questioning continue to nurture and sustain us. Welcome to this celebration of ideas, stories, narratives, of poetry and music, of ideas and conversations. The human race has evolved through its ability to tell stories and to share each other's narratives. A world without stories would be a world without chronicles, without history, or science, or creativity, or intuition. This week, this weekend, beginning today, we look at the world as it is and as it could be. Our opening session just now with Monica Ali takes us through the complications of love, family, and identity. We welcome Gitanjali Sri, Booker International Awardee of 2022, who will tell us of borders and boundaries and her novel, Reit Samadhi, translated by the stellar translator Daisy Rockwell as Tomb of Sand. Uh, it's a special delight to have Amish, author, diplomat, now filmmaker, and the director of the Nehru Center, join us again at the British Library. We are honored to have Ram Chandra Guha speak of his recent book, Rebels Against the Raj, Western Fighters for India's Freedom. We examine Eastminster, Westminster, constitutions and their fault lines with Helena Kennedy, Tripur Daman Singh, Chintan Chandrachur. We speak of foremothers, matriarchs, and memories, of new media and the slipstream of um, information, of Russia yesterday and today, of architectural and cultural history in Hampi and Vijayanagar, of the creative economy, of agriculture and the roots of democracy, of Bangladesh and the birth of a nation. We speak of crime and punishment with Vaseem Khan and Sonia Falerio and Shravani Basu. Nikesh Shukla tells us of how our stories matter. The stellar Shashi Tharoor tells us of pride, prejudice, and punditry, and also has a very special surprise for audiences, which wait and watch. It'll be bigger than the fire. <laughs> we end with hope and laughter, for in our uncertain times, laughter too is a form of courage. We must battle the collective amnesia, the instant and disposable memories that are a reality of the present. The future holds a universe of new narratives, unfolding stories. This present too will become history, and future generations will turn to our chronicles to better understand themselves and the world. Join us over the weekend to celebrate books and ideas, music, poetry, my gratitude to my co-director, William Dalrymple. Between us, we bring a very wide perspective, and Sanjoy Roy's ever sharp eye points out newer and better things for us to do as well. The colleagues at Teamworks, thank you all for this joyous journey so full of learnings over the last 15 years. Thank you, Jai Hind. This used to be my London office. Many of my books were researched upstairs. Somewhere deep in the bowels, there are said to be 36 miles of East India Company documents lurking in the, uh, under our feet somewhere. Uh, and so much of the history of the two countries lies around us. Um, I hope you have take time to have a look at some of the exhibitions uh, and some of the extraordinary manuscripts uh, in the exhibition galleries. It is wonderful to be back in person. We had a small festival last year, but to be back now in, in, in the, with the full GLF, despite uh, uh, the uh, slight hiccup uh, of earlier this afternoon. And it's very nice to see that we brought the Delhi heat dome with us, uh, and, uh, uh, warming up the, uh, the London pavements with a bit of uh, Indian, Indian sun and heat. We have an extraordinary program uh, this year. I think it's actually the best program we've ever brought to London, um, the finest writers from, from both countries, uh, ranging from uh, Gitanjali, 
Pallavi Iyer, who finally got her visa and made it to the, with minutes to spare after a bit of a hiccup. Remo, uh, we have the, around the room so many uh, great talents, but also uh, many uh, wonderful writers from here. Anthony Beaver, who uh, has a knack of timing things perfectly and has produced a book on Russia and the Russian Revolution, just uh, uh, perfectly coming out this week in time to catch uh, renewed interest, sadly, in that part of the world. Uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore, uh, the great Colin Thubron, arguably the greatest uh, travel writer uh, alive. Um, and it's lovely to see these two worlds come together in this way. And um, we, we haven't, um, we, we have uh, negotiated uh, all the perils. We, br we brought writers to the Maldives a month ago and nearly had them eaten by sharks. We've uh, nearly burnt you all alive this afternoon. <laughs> Vegetarian <laughs> But the show goes on, the show goes on. So please, uh, uh, can I welcome to the stage? I think, is it straight away? Yes. No, uh, not, no not yet. No, we have more speeches. <laughs> you have more speeches. Uh, can I, uh, big hand for more speeches. Thank you. <laughs>
Our partnership with Jaipur Literature, Fe Literature Festival is part of the British Council's India-UK Together season, a season of culture which marks the deep connections and 75th anniversary of India with a landmark program that will strengthen the friendship and vibrant cultural bonds of both countries while addressing shared global challenges. Throughout the season, People in India and the UK will have the chance to experience innovative and exciting creative work from some of the best UK and Indian arts organizations, artists and institutions creating together. The season has a strand which focuses specifically on literature and we'll see writers, poets, translators and publishers come together to collaborate, create new work and build stronger connections. We really look forward to bringing forward new voices, new writing, new translations, which will contribute to the next generation of our very special shared cultural and literary heritage. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Sanjoy Roy and the Teamwork Arts team, the team at the British Council for all of their work putting together this phenomenal and exciting program. And now I'd like to invite Monica and Jayshree to the stage. working. Thank you JLF for entrusting me with the kickoff session. Honored. <laughs> and welcome everyone. Um, I suppose I should, I should start by explaining I was dressed for the stage. <laughs> Dim lighting, flowy clothes, lots of makeup, so forgive me if I look a bit scary <laughs> sitting here in the, in the tent with all my slap on. Um, I should also apologize. I think there are a few of you here who came expecting to see Gurinda Chadha on stage with Monica Ali. Uh, she couldn't be here tonight, so I'm afraid I am what you've got. Um, I'm sorry if you're disappointed, oh, but <laughs> I know I, this wasn't meant to evoke compliments and all of that. But I just thought I should tell everybody that I'm sometimes disappointed. I'm not Gurinda Chadha, so I know exactly how you feel. Uh, but I should endeavor to make this as entertaining for you as possible, aided by where's our book gone? <laughs> aided by a very entertaining book, so it shouldn't be too difficult for me, and a very engaging author. That was one hell of a book. You, ke you kept us waiting a long time, 10 years in the making. Yeah, was it worth it? It was a cracking <laughs> read. It really was a cracking <laughs> read. I, just, I suppose I want to start by asking whether it was as much fun for you to write as it is a reading experience. Um, it was a lot of fun to write, but writing is, you know, nine parts torture to one part, you know, just enormous fulfilment and pleasure. But with this book, as soon as I had, because I started off writing two different stories and I wasn't sure that either of them was going to turn into a book. There was um, a story about Yasmin, who is now the protagonist of Brick Lane, and she's a junior doctor at a big London hospital, and it was about her love life. And then I had another story on the go, which was about Harriet, who is a North London, sort of liberal, lovey, intellectual, famous force feminist, of force of nature. Um, but I wasn't sure that either was going to be the book that um, I was going to actually tackle. And then I had this light bulb moment when I thought, what if I put them together? And writing is, you know, 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. And this was, you know, the 1%. As soon as I thought that, I thought it's going to be a lot of fun to write. And I knew that it was the book that I had to write. This is quite, it's very funny, especially in the beginning. It it's, it's, it's sort of starts off a bit like a typical comedy of manners. Mm -hmm. and it's very tempting to imagine the author guffawing and laughing. I used to imagine P.G. Woodhouse doing this, tears running down his face as he's busy writing. <laughs> he wouldn't have used a keyboard in his time. But comedy can take a lot of hard graft as well, isn't it? It's, it's, it's about getting the timing absolutely right and getting it spot on. So yes. I couldn't figure it out because it was such fun, the first few pages, after which it starts to get, it starts to tackle more of the the serious issues and it deepens in different ways. So yeah. change tone slightly, I think. Yeah, I mean, I hope that the, the, the um, comedy or the humor, let's say, I prefer humor, I think, to, to comedy. comedy. You're right. But, it's, it's, yeah, but I, I hope that the humor doesn't disappear. But you're right, it deals with a lot of um, 
difficult shit because that you know life throws that at us, and I think with humour it's possible to sort of see all our folly and frailty and human striving and ridiculousness and just hold it with compassion. So that's you know that's what I try to do. That that was I think what I was trying to get at is how much of that is is hard work and as you say perspiration. Mm. And how much of it is just your way of looking at the world? Because a lot of, like you said, very difficult issues are tackled quite lightly and with this, in this very sympathetic, empathetic way. So it, does that come from just your own attitude to the world? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, you, you're, um, you're, which isn't to say that it's not hard work writing. But I think, yeah, I, I, absolutely, that, that is my way of um, coping <laughs> with the world. Yeah. Well, there will be people here who wouldn't have read the book, so I think should we start with a little reading? And, and sure. that will give you a glimpse into what I'm trying to say about the, the, the humour that you've kind of experienced. I'd say virtually from page one. <laughs> it sort of hits you right there. Shall I read now? Yes, please. And you've chosen your passage. So I'll, I'll just read for, what, 45 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Could close the doors. Oh, it's not doors. easier yeah. for both of us. Right. There are some Eastern European countries where you have to read for like two <laughs> That's hours. True. You In Germany as well, you have to do that. Don't worry. Um, two, three minutes. <laughs> Be fine. I'm, st I'm starting from page one, so I don't need to do any setting of the scene. In the Garami household. <laughs> it's like a stage play, isn't it? The Garami household has arrived. <laughs> All right. In the Garami household, sex was never mentioned. If the television was on and a kissing with tongue scene threatened the chaste and cardamom-scented home, it was swiftly terminated by a flick of the black box. When Yasmin began her first period, her mother had slipped her a pack of Kotex maxi pads and murmured instructions not to touch the Quran. This was confusing because Yasmin never touched the Quran anyway, <laughs> except at the behest of her mother. But it also made sense because menstruation, as she had learned in a biology class, was linked to reproduction. And the dotted line diagrams in the textbook were surprisingly, yet undeniably, linked to the actors who push their tongues into each other's mouths, thus ruining everyone's viewing pleasure. Now, at the age of 26, Yasmin knew all about sex. The human body had long since yielded its mysteries. She had slept with three men and was engaged to be married to the third, Joe, a fellow doctor at St Barnabas Hospital. Her parents, Shokat and Anisha, liked Joe because as a doctor, he was automatically suitable. And because everyone liked Joe, he was gifted that way. If Anisha longed for her daughter to marry a good Muslim boy, it was an opinion she kept to herself. Yasmin sat cross-legged on her bed, surrounded by medical texts, waiting to be called down for dinner. She should have been studying for yet another exam, but couldn't concentrate. Four books lay open to demonstrate a commitment that she was unable to put into effect. Instead, she leafed through a magazine she'd found discarded on the train. When tomorrow night was over, she'd laugh at herself. It wouldn't be as bad as she imagined. Her parents would meet Joe's mother for the first time. They'd all eat dinner together at her house in Primrose Hill and discuss wedding plans and make polite conversation. Big deal. The thought of her parents inside that discreetly sumptuous Georgian terrace induced a faint feeling of nausea. She swallowed it down. Nothing embarrassing would happen. Fretting like this was stupid. The bedroom door opened and Arif slid in. That is some bush, he said, shaking his head. She slipped the magazine under a book. Out, she said, I'm working. His words slowly infiltrated. Out, she said again. Arif closed the door 
and leaned his boneless, insolent body against it. You know about it, yeah? The picture. Like I was telling you, every article about it goes on about it, but I had to dig bare deep to find it. Want to see, Eppa? He pulled his phone out of his jeans. Yasmin had decided she wouldn't react, no matter what provocations her maladjusted little brother attempted. In spite of herself, she recoiled, shrinking back on the bed as Arif brandished the phone. The last thing in the world she wanted to see was Harriet Sangster's private parts. She wondered, not for the first time, if Joe had seen the infamous photo of his mother, naked on her back with her legs split wide, head raised to stare, challenging and defiant, straight into the lens. It's a feminist photo, she said, and her voice remained even. It was decades ago. You wouldn't understand. Stick with your porn. Stick with your hairless porn. I sort of shot out of my chair at the point at which Yasmin yells, stick to your hairless <laughs> porn to her brother. Because she, she was clearly, by page two, going to be a completely different kettle of fish to Nazneen of, of Brick Lane. Did. Yeah. You, you signaled that very early on, much to my delight. Yeah. <laughs> much as I like Nazneen, you know, much as I sympathize with her, uh, this, this, the kind of spirited young Bengali woman we were going to deal mm -hmm. with get in this book was, was an indicator very early on. That was, that was very heartening. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, um, the sort of slight, sleight of hand you've employed in calling the book Love Marriage. Yeah. Because um, while there is a lot about love in it, not just romantic love, there's all kinds of love. And while there's a fabulous will they, won't they marriage story in it as well, um, Essentially, the book is about sex, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> well, oh. that makes it sound as if your characters are at it all the time, which they're not, obviously. This um, isn't Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, how embarrassing. <laughs> no, no, you, no, you're right. You're right. It, it is. Thematically. The, thematically, it is. It's also, as you say, it's about love. It's about marriage. It's about family relationships, adult child to parent relationship it's, it's, a, it's about many many things but the narrative backbone as you have so astutely um <laughs> seen and i think you know all readers do see it but it, it it's it's the the necklace on which all of the beads are threaded so it's not I mean, there are two sex scenes in the book. It is not Fifty Shades of Grey. But there is You'll be really scenes. disappointed if, you know, if that's what you're signing up for. It's not like that at all. But it's, mm. it's the thing that, uh, um, that many of the major plot points turn on. So whether that's infidelity, revenge sex, uh, sexual addiction, um, sexual violence, um, issues of sexual identity, um, it's how the protagonists sort of wrestle with their um, own identities or mature into those identities. And even a really tricky incest narrative, which obviously, I mean, I'm very worried about spoilers because there are some really key turning points in the book that I would hate to give away. So I think I might ask you to, because I know in some of your interviews that I've watched, you do actually explain a little bit about the sex addiction yeah. storyline as well. So I'm going to ask you to explain the, to the background. I know people have heard the first two pages, but just a little synopsis of what you think the essential story is. So I know up to where I can go with the, the spoiler elements. <laughs> OK. Um, I hate to give anything away that you wouldn't want to. So I won't say what happens in the end. No, certainly no, not. <laughs> no, OK. Um, so, I mean, Yasmin, as we've just heard, is engaged to be married to this. I mean, he's, he's a wonderful m man. He's a fellow doctor. He's handsome. He's charming. He's rich. He's also really kind and caring and sensitive. Um, but then he does the unthinkable and he cheats on her. Um, and then she does something that shocks her even more which is that she then has, it's sort of, it's more than revenge sex, but you know, that's how it sort of starts off with a colleague. Um, and so this is tearing her up inside because she's always been such a follower of the rules, a 
good girl, a good daughter, a dutiful person, um, a good, good in the moral sense as well. So then she's harboring this terrible, as she sees it, secret. But what she doesn't know is that Joe has an even bigger secret, which is that he is a sex addict. And that was the, that, that was the thing that was the most difficult structurally to approach and to narrate. I needed to find a way of doing it that didn't lose the sympathy of the reader. Because sex addiction is like, oh, is that really a thing? Is he just a dickhead? <laughs> I was like, is he, you know, it's a, sort of, it's a selfish thing, it's, a, it's an excuse, it doesn't really exist, all of that. So my decision was that um, we needed to be close to Joe, and the reader needed to be close to Joe, but without being directly given his perspective, because if I had that from the beginning, then we would know right from the beginning about this, about this addiction. So he's in therapy for his addiction, and it's through the therapist's point of view that we come to understand Joe and his addiction. And that was really a, 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 an important exploration for me, the nature of addiction. I'm so pleased you mentioned that because it's very difficult to talk about the book without everyone yeah. knowing that Joe has this, this problem. And the device you use of the therapist was brilliant, I thought, because there really was no other way, was there, to create a sympathy if we were hearing or yes. seeing everything from Joe's point of view, yes. isn't it? And then the, the complication of then realizing what happens to Yasmin when she, uh, sort of when all this starts to reveal itself yes. to her. I mean, I really loved writing the... Sa Sandor is the name of the th therapist, and I loved writing his scenes. And when I wrote, when I wrote my first draft of the book, it was really long, because I just couldn't start writing. It was 240,000 words. Goodness but don't worry, it's nowhere near that long. I've now cut... I, you know, I cut it then more or less in half. But one of the things that had to, to go, or, um, or quite a lot of it, was Sandor's Sandor. story. But now I'm adapting it for the screen for, for TV. And it's great, because TV is really, really story hungry as a medium, so I can bring back a lot of Sandor's parts that had to, you know, hit the floor oh, earlier. that's fabulous. Yeah. Because he is, I mean, the very fact that he refers to Joe as the boy throughout is a reminder of how young this couple really are. Yes. I mean, they're, they're trying to find their way through love and you know, marriage being the ultimate goal in their minds, and it's a, it's a tricky terrain yes. for them to traverse, isn't yeah. it? So you do really feel for them. And I felt very much for Yasmin, actually, who, I, partially because she is a woman of science, maybe, or because she just is that kind of a person. She's, you know, she can't give herself up to the feelings of, even when she's feeling loving and glowy, she goes, Oxytocin, was that the word? Yeah. Oxytocin, yeah, that, that's what's happening to my body right now. Or dopamine, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's why my body's reacting in the way it is. And you feel for her, and she's, she's a little bit of an anxious sort, isn't she? She and is. And as the book opens, the big anxiety is the meeting of these two families. Now, every single South Asian in the room will understand <laughs> immediately that a marriage is never a marriage between two individuals. It's two entire it's between clans two families. coming together. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing is that it doesn't matter. You don't have to have a, you know, a South Asian background. People understand that all over the world, I so think. I gathered, you know, yeah. my... my, my um, my daughter, I'm going to blame this on my daughter. My daughter <laughs> makes me watch this terrible reality TV show called Married at First Sight, Australia. <laughs> OK, I make her watch it, actually. <laughs> it's, ju it's just brilliant. And the idea is it's appalling, really low-rent, uh, manipulative, very, very addictive te television. <laughs> um, so you, you have this panel of three so-called ex experts who match um, two single people, and the first time that they meet is when, at, they, get is when they get married, <laughs> and then they have to live together, and then, you know, it follows. So there's all sorts of dramas, but, you know, a really big point in... Um, I and mean, this is totally irrelevant to the book. I don't know why I'm talking about this, but I'm obsessed with it. I'll stop but a you, really, you. Well, a really big point is when they, um, they meet the families and the friends, and, of course... Of course it's germane to whether the, the marriage is going to be a success. Of course it is. So it's not just 
you know, somehow in the UK you think, oh, well, it's just, uh, you know, two individuals meet and nothing else matters. But, this, but it this, does matter. And despite the differences uh, in every way, racially, culturally, uh, class, you know, in mm. so many ways, these are two such different families. It actually works out reasonably well to start with, doesn't it? Well, the, the, I mean, Yasmin's um, anxiety at the beginning is, I think, really understandable because any bride-to-be, it, it, it's, it's going to be a big thing in the family's meeting for the first time. Plus, the Garamis are, you know, pretty conservative, I'd say, culturally, and Harriet is the complete opposite. It should be a lot to handle for anyone. There's also a class anxiety. I mean, the Garamis are solid middle class. The father is a doctor, Yasmin's a doctor. They live in a nice suburb. But Harriet is like properly posh, um, moneyed, and, you know, uh, upper middle class, I, I would say. So there's a class anxiety around that. But what happens when they get together is that Harriet embraces the Garamis especially Anisha, much too much for Yasmin's liking. And then, then she's like, you know, what the hell? It, I, I wasn't supposed to be getting an Indian-style mother-in-law who starts interfering in the yeah, wedding yeah. planning and, you know, t takes it all uh, into her bosom and interferes. Um, so, yes, what, her, her worst nightmares are not borne out in the way that she thinks they're going to be borne out. They're borne out in a completely it, different in a way. In different set yeah. of circumstances. But, um, I mean, Harriet really, force of nature is one way of describing her. But, you know, when I was... Um, Have she you kind met of any explained, Oh, I know lots of Harriets. Yeah, I've been I invited by a Harriet to, to display my Indian cooking to friends of hers. <laughs> so it's actually... <laughs> these, these Harriets, I think North London abounds in Harriets. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be amazed. Is she based on anyone? You know a whole oh, lot of Harriet's. No. <laughs> um, no. Um, I mean, you'd be amazed at how many people have said to me, I'm worried I might be Harriet. I think I, <laughs> am I Harriet? I think I might be Harriet. And I go, no, 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 no. I was worried this friend of mine would read your book and, and think, oh, I'm Harriet. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, Harriet, um, on, a very, you know, on a superficial reading, you could say, oh, she's like an example of white privilege and... She does integration by steamroller. Um, <laughs> I wonder what Jo says. Um, she's what her, the the Goramis are Indian enough to give her an orgasm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing she likes better than yeah, the she, idea she of Indian that. relatives. <laughs> but you know, Yasmin is very suspicious of of Harriet's intentions, and she's like, oh, she's exoticizing Ma. She's treating her like a pet. But actually, Yasmin is wrong. You know, and um, there is a friendship. There. Yasmin is making assumptions. Yasmin hates it when people make assumptions about oh, her God. based on her gender, her ethnicity, quite rightly so. But she's making assumptions about other people, left, right and centre, including about Harriet, and she's not right about Harriet. No. And I, to, to, to me, Harriet has a really good heart. Yes, she can be a bit annoying. Yes, she can be overbearing. Um, but she's got her own demons. She's got you know, family dynamics that she doesn't understand. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, She's very fond of Harriet, yeah, actually. She grew on me, I have to say. I was a bit frightened of her at first, and then and I thought, what an <laughs> awful mother-in-law to get. <laughs> and then, you know, I really felt for Yasmin, and then she started to grow on me as well, Harriet, I could see. She actually answered a question I'd ha had for a long time, because when I, was, when I came to England as a student, um, you know, went down to the university swimming pool and was startled, astonished actually, to see women walking around naked uh, in the in the changing room. Uh, me with my good yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. South Asian inhibitions and sensibilities. Uh, when I asked an Indian friend about it, mentioned it to someone who'd been here longer than me, she very sagely informed me, oh, posh English people, they walk around naked all the time in front of their children. Didn't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been able to corroborate that with posh English people. But <laughs> Harriet Pye, there's, there's a few probably in the room. Posh English really? people, maybe later on. <laughs> Don't say that, I know. <laughs> but Harriet kind of, I think, watching the interaction between her and Joe kind of, started to answer some of the questions I'd always had about mm. posh English people and you know how they interact at home. But like you said, it's a complicated It is very story. complicated. It's yeah. a very complicated backstory. Um, you know, at the beginning of the book, Yasmin is, I would say, quite envious of 
Joe and his mother, the Sangsters, that that household, they're open, they talk about everything, they discuss everything openly, sex doesn't have to be a, a, a secret thing, you know, it's not unmentionable like in our household. And she can but walk into the bathroom when he's showering. Yeah, or, or, yeah exactly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wanted really to play a bit with those old tropes or stereotypes of, oh, a South Asian culture is more closed and therefore more backwards in some way, and a Western um, culture is more open and therefore better and freer and so on. You know, I just wanted to just prod and poke at that because, you know, yeah, uh, Joe and Harriet don't talk about everything openly. They can't because they don't understand themselves and they don't understand their family dynamics and relationships. And Joe with this sex addiction is anything but free. I mean, he's the very definition of shackled to his, um, his compulsions. You know, he's not free at all. So, yeah, I just wanted to sort of poke and prod a little bit at those assumptions, you know, is it always better <laughs> to, to, to have the sort of the liberal open attitude? Does it always lead to the best results? And, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's a bit more complicated it, it than that. It is a lot more, isn't it? Yeah. And one of the things Harriet wants, is, you know, starts to do is invite Anissa to her house to talk to her friends about Islam. Yeah. Um, so I did want to ask you about Islamophobia because Harriet, you kind of invert it very cleverly with Harriet, is that she's, she's very keen to not be seen as Islamophobic. In fact, mm. the very reverse. Uh, she, she wants to cock a snook at her Islamophobic friends, so she insists on the nikah and yeah. she wants to invite an imam to the wedding. It's kind of, like you said, steamrollering her way through yes. the wedding plans yes. that Joe and Yasmin have. But uh, there was also that you tackle Islamophobia, I thought, very well in the character of Rania, who's, mm -hmm. who's uh, Yasmin's friend from her school days. Mm -hmm. So she's this jeans wearing, you know, great big green eyeshadow, uh, but wears the hijab. Yes. And is constantly being invited to talk about oppression, hijab oppression, yes. she says. Yes. So you talk about the hijab hypocrisy of, of Europe. I mean, I think, again, People who've come from India to this will be well aware of the levels to which Islamophobia have kind of gone. And I, I'm not here to quiz your knowledge of the Indian political situation, dire as it is. Yes. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about that. But the fact that you've tackled it, tackled what Muslims here probably have to deal with on a daily basis, I thought was mm. quite mm. was clever and sort of lightly done again, as you seem to have tackled all the big issues in, in the book. Well, thank you. I, I, I mean, there's also um, Arif, who is um, Yasmin's little brother, who's kind of the black sheep of the family, if that's... Um, you know, he's done a degree in sociology, which is of no use to anyone, according to his father. It's like, what is the point? You've got to be an accountant or a doctor. Um, and he, Arif, has already been profiled when he was at university. So a lot of show cats rage around Arif and what he's doing with his life actually comes from worry and anxiety about it. Life is just harder to, for a young Muslim man in this, in this country. So beneath all that anger is anxiety and beneath the anxiety is, you know, love for his son. So it, you know, what I try to do is to play out it's not about the issues, it's about the family dynamics. I mean, that's what interests me. And each of those characters has a different point of view. And from where Showcat stands, Arif complaining about prejudice in the UK, Showcat is like, well, you know, back in India, you don't talk, we're not talking about microaggressions against Muslims, we're talking about you know, something far, far more serious. So, again, it's from the perspective of the character. Um, those dynamics were very, very interesting as well. You know, the, the f in, in a typical South Asian family, you would probably find the son is the, the revered one, and yeah. the daughters are the ones who get put upon slightly. Yeah. But, um, you, again, that's kind of inverted. Yes. 
And I, that was very interesting, I thought, that uh, Yasmin's the one who's always towed the line and done exactly what was expected of her, and, and rises, you know, sort of rises to all her father's big expectations. She, she does, and she sort of resents it as well in some yeah. way, doesn't she? And, uh, you, you know, the, the relationship with Arif that she has is quite complicated by that because she, she feels like she's had to be more and more dutiful to fill in for his misdemeanours, but also yeah. she has a really sweet relationship with Arif. Oh yes, and he's the one who's actually, in the end, clever at finding love. Yes. <laughs> if you wanted sort of a more positive route through whatever love, you know, and all, of, all the stuff that would lead to marriage. Arif's the one who seems to master it surprisingly, astonishingly, while Yasmin's still kind of floundering. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And I think with his relationships, I think there's, very, there's less distance between surface and reality. And I think a lot of what I'm unpacking and dealing with in, in the rest of the book, with the Garamis, with the Sangsters, is the appearance and then what's really underneath. And with Arif and his girlfriend's family, you really, what you see is what you get, and therefore there's much less anxiety. Yeah. Ooh. I uh, need to ask you about research as well, because the, the, the most moving scenes, for me certainly, I, you know, brought tears to my eyes, were the ones set in the geriatric ward mm. where Yasmin yeah. works. And obviously a book that features where the two main protagonists are junior doctors. <laughs> mm. There's a lot in it, they're working in a busy London hospital and, you know, all the pressures and tensions yeah. of life as a junior doctor. It's just brilliantly done, I thought. I mean, these would be news reports that I would have read or you know, some kind of report comes out talking about the NHS. Very recently there was one about discrimination and bullying in the NHS. And all of those things are there in the book, which presumably you started writing some years ago. <laughs> anyway. yes. yeah. So um, did, what kind of research did you do for that? I mean, I first, I knew you weren't a doctor, and then I thought, I know, she must be married to a doctor. <laughs> Bonica <laughs> Ali, husband, and no, he isn't a doctor either. So I, I, I just had to ask you about it. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's funny. I was interviewed at the Birth Literary Festival by <laughs> Rachel Clark, who is a doctor. She's a palliative care doctor, and um, she's also an author. She wrote a book, uh, her first book was uh, called Your Life in my hands, diaries of a junior doctor, and she's just got another one called Breathless. Anyway, she interviewed me at birth, and she said, "Oh, I was I was looking for the mistakes in your book <laughs> for all the you know in the in the wards, and you know actually, and then I thought, well, what you know what's really difficult because you can get the facts checked is trying to make the atmosphere and how do you, how did you do that? And I ended up googling to see if you were a doctor, if you had a <laughs> medical exactly. background, and I just thought. I mean, th that's just a brag for no reason. That's just because I'm really proud of that. It's not even a humble brag, it's just a brag. But, you know, I did loads of research. I read a lot. I mean, everyone's got experience of the NHS. Everyone's got, you know, my, my grandmother uh, on my mother's side, you know, she died at the age of 96, so she was in and out of hospital. Um, and then lots of journals. I still get emails from the subscriptions department at the New England Journal of Medicine saying, <laughs> you know, come back and resubscribe. So I, I don't need to read need that. another <laughs> medical journal. But I like doing research. Yeah. And the, the thing about research is that you've got to then put it aside and not be tempted to do a an info dump because information is cheap really right. let's face it i mean you know the you don't have to have a membership to the british library <laughs> which i do but you know you don't have you don't have to have that information is really cheap so doing the research is a great way of putting off that evil day when it's you and the blank page and then research gives you the courage to make things up i remember being told once in fact i was researching something here lock all that research away in a cupboard yeah. before you even sit down to yeah. write and that's clearly what you've done because there's no info dump and there's no large tracts about the nhs and how you know all the different reports you probably had to read <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now i don't want to put you on the spot too much but i found i dug up an old essay that's that you'd written a really <laughs> ominous it's start awful, isn't to it? a question <laughs> but i found something that you wrote in an old guardian essay probably around the time you, you were writing brick lane so I just yeah. wanted to know, it's, it's, a, it's a way of charting the journey you might have made as a writer from, when was that, about 20 years ago? Yeah. And so I wrote it down because um, I wanted to get your words right. But you talk about the tyranny of representation. You were quoting C.L.R. James and you said, yeah. 
the, meaning that your brown skin becomes the dominant signifier mm. when you write. Um, and after that, the books, I mean, I was assuming that you wrote this at the time Brick Lane came out, but the books that you wrote after that seemed to take a very determined path away from allowing your brown skin to be the signifier in your writing. So, and now, in a little in strange sort of way, you've returned. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, well, I see it a bit differently, as in, wasn't a determined whatever, that's just me, that's who I am. You know, I'm not one thing or the other, I'm both. And I'm really, you know, happy to be both. So my writing is a ref reflection of that rather than, I think, you know, at the time and subsequently, I did have that question posed in slightly different, less intelligent ways than you've just put it. Um, you know, are you trying to get away from brick Are you trying to get away from your, I don't know what, ethnicity? I mean, you know, how would you do that? And um, why would I want to? Do you know what I mean? Th th this is who I am. And um, I understand that it's difficult for people to, <laughs> to sort of get that. I but I don't think it's that hard. I don't know. No anyway. pressure from publishers and agents. Because the, the reason I'm asking is, again, it goes back to love marriage, is that brilliant cameo you have of this young man called Nathan, who's mm. one of Harriet's mentees. He's, he's, he's a... He's a uh, aspiring author. He's written an eco thriller, which he's struggling to get published. Mm. Uh, and then Harriet herself tells him, I think she doesn't cover herself in glory, does she? When she yeah. tells him, um, stick to something closer to home, perhaps, mm. she says. Mm -hmm. And like in that. that one line is, I thought, a whole world of the kind of expectations that are brought to someone ostensibly brown skinned who's, try who's working and writing in this uh, milieu. And was, I did wonder whether there was a sense of, it's a little pot shot at the publishers. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they're not here, which is why I asked you earlier, are your publishers here tonight? <laughs> no, they're <laughs> not here. They're, so you can say what you like. Um, yeah, I try, uh, you know, I tried, I've tried to avoid looking at reviews, but you always get to know some of the things because people tell you or the publisher sends you a couple of lines or whatever. Um, there was one review of Love Marriage from one of the broadsheets, must have been the Times or I don't know. Um, we were, sta my husband and I went to see his parents who live in Bristol and my mother-in-law, because she's proud, had put the, this review on the fridge. So then it's at which point it's really difficult to avoid. <laughs> so <laughs> while you're eating your cornflakes in the morning. And the headline was something like um, uh, Brick Lane for 2022, but with, with more sex, which is the most inane thing. So it's just really, really stupid. It's actually quite a good selling line, so maybe I shouldn't deconstruct it too much, but you know, it is stupid. It shows the kind of um, surface level of understanding. Mm -hmm. So if I think back to Brick Lane, um, Nasneen, the protagonist, she grows up in rural Bangladesh. She's not educated. She doesn't speak much English or a few words. She's working class. She lives in a working class community in Tower Hamlet. Her husband's largely unemployed. It's quite a tight knit. Um, poor community. Um, whereas Yasmin, uh, she's highly educated, she's born in London, she's middle class, she lives in a nice suburb and a you know place where everyone minds their own business and she has a di completely different set of family dynamics and relationship issues and so on. So I just, it just makes me wonder, you know, if um, if I were a white writer and 20 years ago I'd written about an uneducated, working class family and working class community in one part of London, then 20 years old I wrote about a middle class, also white family who are professionals and have different... I don't think anyone would be saying, oh, it's that, it's a white family again. It's just like, you know, brown people were not all the same. You know, it's it's just sort but of I think, yeah, many gobsmacking. A book about brown people, another book oh, about yeah, brown. brown. It's just people. brown and brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, do we have? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've been told uh, people gasping for their cocktails. Oh no, there is. 
Yeah. Okay, so the little, a little time for audience Q&A. I've been instructed, shut up. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a roving microphone. If you put your hands up and we'll... Uh, just making sure I covered everything I wanted to ask you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Monica. It's really a pleasure to hear you. I haven't read your book, um, and I just, uh, I tend to. Uh, I just want to say, I'm a PhD in sociology, much like Arif. <laughs> I don't know much about love, unlike Arif, I suppose. <laughs> but I did end up writing a book on love oh. called Beyond Love and Arranged Marriage. It was based on um, Indians and like middle class India, actually. Oh, um, obviously, also quite boring because it's sort of academic, so it can't really be as interesting to the audiences. But one aspect that came out in my research, and I was just wondering if that figures in, in your book, um, was also the factor of age. So we talked about anxiety, Jayashree, you mentioned anxieties. Uh, and I was wondering how, how does, that, does that feature in any of the protagonists, white or brown or however, when they're thinking, is this now time for me to get married? There's pressure to get married. Um, uh, because one of the things that I found out was that when you're sort of younger, you're more interested in experimenting and one of the things uh, related to sex what i what i found was that um if a boyfriend is not pleasing in bed it's okay uh in if, if you're in your 20s uh post third or uh, in your 30s they're like they never please in bed so that can never really be uh, uh <laughs> that, that shouldn't be that shouldn't no that's no longer a criteria so one of the things that i researched was how the criteria changes and and it was age and also related to sex. And I was just wondering if, if any of this features in, in your protagonist and, and your storyline. Yeah. yeah, so hang on, what were you saying? That in your 20s, it doesn't matter if the boyfriend is good in bed, and in your 30s, it, matters. it doesn't matter. It, it, oh, it, matters. Does matter. it, matters, it matters then, and they might break up for that. So they're more right. kind of self-aware, and they're more assertive. And then as age passes, then they sort of let go of so many of the desires um, or, or aspirations that they have out of marriage. Yeah both for men and women, but definitely for women with regard to sex uh, is, is what I, yeah. Mm. So it's just <laughs> Interesting. Um, <laughs> gosh, I don't, I don't know how to answer which that you've now. Your agony aunt and uh, everything <laughs> rolled into one. Uh, I mean, yeah, Yasmin does have, um, she, she grapples with, se sexual desire is really part of her coming into her own. And for that reason, I knew I had to write the sex scenes, although there's only two short ones. They were really crucial. They're very steamy. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're very steamy. Um, but, you know, I was dreading it. I was absolutely dreading writing the, those scenes. With Nazneen in Brick Lane, she, has a, she takes a lover as well. But I didn't need to write the sex because it was in keeping with Nazneen's character. I just close the door, close the curtain. We don't need to say her that. But with Yasmin, it really is a, a sort of a, a, an integral part of her um, maturing, becoming a woman, uh, finding her own um, desires, seeing how much she's been in denial about her own desires. Um, but for, yeah, so for those reasons, I, I knew I couldn't sort of bottle out of it. But it's a terrible thing to have to write a sex scene because you've got the bad sex I award sort of hovering yeah. <laughs> over your head and you think, um, oh my God. Um, so I guess for her, it's a bit of a different journey. And for Jo, it, 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 sex is so, it's such a... I can't answer that question in a short amount of time because it's such a big thing and for him to unravel. Away. Yeah, you'll have to read the yeah. book. There is a lot about is a lot. And all the things yeah. that you, you, you touch upon probably in your book. <laughs> what, what's your book so, called? Um, incredibly Academic. It's called Matchmaking Plus in the Beyond Arrangement of Love Marriage. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> When, when you do read her book, look out for a, a, a pepper, pepper Pepperdine. A Dr. Pepperdine. Everyone has the hot for yeah. Pepperdine. Well, look, everyone wants to either meet him themselves yeah. or introduce all their single friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just uh, interesting about the um, research you said you did 
bit about the book in the medical thing. So I'm just curious about the research you did before Google and everything on Brick Lane, you know. How, you know, just the curious, and maybe we were talking for, about it. For Brick Lane. Um, I did loads of research for that as well, um, in different ways. So um, I spent a lot of time with youth workers and social workers in the area, women's groups. Um, hanging out, seeing where, where, I mean, things like where the drugs drops were happening, because there was a heroin problem at the time. Um, so it, it was a lot of talking to people, a lot of interviewing, and then whatever research materials I could get my hands on, which frankly wasn't that much, because nobody was really interested in what was going on there. So it was more a question of going out and talking to people. Um, I haven't been there in a in a while. Oh well, I was at, at the Brick Lane Bookshop actually recently. So yeah, I was there. I was there then. Yeah, it's changed so much. Could you use the mic, please? I think he's finished. I, yeah, it did remind me actually of the protests that took place in Tower Hamlets when the filming of Brick Lane happened and there were you know, people, I mean, people, Asians in particular, we complain a lot when we are not represented in the, within the pages of books and then when you are, you sort of up in arms, oh, it's caricature. <laughs> and, you know, Jermaine Greer, we waded into that whole debate as well, which was just, I hope she's not here because everyone comes to GLF. <laughs> Jermaine Greer might well be in the audience. <laughs> But um, yeah, there's you know, I, the, to me the most beloved character in Brick Lane was Chanu, and I don't know whether they were talking about him being cat because they said the Bengali male has been caricatured or something like that. And yeah, I so identified. It might sound curious to say, but I so identified with Chanu because like him, yeah. I came from India late in life. I came with an MA in English literature, rolled up yeah, in my yeah. suitcase. Thought if I spouted Shakespeare at people, they would yeah. like me, <laughs> and soon learned my lessons. But Chanu never did. No. No, so felt for him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, it just—it wasn't um, the case, however, that people with a Bangladeshi heritage in this country or around the world. Because I went around the world with um, that book. It's not true that they didn't like it. There was a handful of yeah. people. They were older, conservative men, who I think reading between the lines didn't like the fact that this young bride has a, an affair. Um, but, you know, I, I was actually, I used to be a patron of the, the Clement Attlee Youth Centre, which is just behind Brick Lane, and I was doing a, a, something there for some media thing, and a photographer said, oh, I covered that protest for, for the newspapers, but I had to get in very tight because there were only like a handful of <laughs> protesters. And there were more media there <laughs> than there were. So, you know, it really wasn't a thing. But as soon as it's on the telly or uh, which it was, it was on yeah. like the BBC News and stuff, then that's written into history. And that's, you know, oh, that's the reaction from the community. It's just not that's true. All there was. It's well, just that's not true. Very reassuring. Because when you mentioned the TV adaptation of Love Marriage, Mm. I thought, can I see the Indian medical fraternity going up in arms? <laughs> the depiction of Dr. Shaukat. Uh, I thought, well, no, not really. <laughs> I can't see that happening. But I, is it time to wind up? Yes, people really do want their cocktails now. Wasn't so. there one more question for the back? I think the lady wanted to. You're, you're very kind. And it's actually uh, related to your last uh, comments, which was, um, do you think that race relations in this country have got better or worse between Brick Lane and love marriage? Oh, gosh. Let's <laughs> <laughs> have a whole speech. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, isn't, isn't it time for cocktails? <laughs> <laughs> Blimey. I think, Joshua, would you like to answer I'd that one? I'd certainly not like to answer that. It would, it would involve standing there and making a half-hour speech, I, I, and I'm not prepared. I, I think the thing is, it's complicated. I don't have a simple answer for that. Yes. That's why I write novels, because... I don't have to give, I don't have a, um, a sort of position or a take or a, I hate that sort of hot take mentality. I like complexity, I like layers, I like seeing both sides and that's why I'm a novelist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that wonderful note. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Jayashree.
Monica's books are available on sale, and she'll be signing her books outside. So please, and the bookshop is right there. Um, thank you. I'd like to also just continue with the JLF tradition and offer them these scarves. It's my pleasure to also acknowledge with gratitude Ambassador Sujit Ghosh. Thank you so much for being here and for being a support to us. Uh, it's been an interesting day and we have the gorgeous Chorangi restaurant that are our restaurant partners offering. They've been very, very generous and you know the reception is now going to open up for you. We've got some Cobra beer and some wine and the gorgeous food from the Chorangi restaurant. So please join us. Thank you.